In today's episode, we open our Bibles to the book of Joshua, chapters 3 and 4. As the Israelites stand on the banks of the Jordan, Joshua receives specific instructions from Yahweh to have the priests who are bearing the ark step into the river's rushing waters and stand still. In an event that mirrors the earlier crossing of the Red Sea, the Jordan miraculously halts its flow, allowing the entire Israelite nation to cross over on dry ground. And after the Israelites have safely crossed the Jordan River, Joshua is commanded by God to select 12 men, one from each tribe, to retrieve 12 stones from the riverbed. These stones serve as a lasting memorial to commemorate this miraculous crossing. Good morning and blessed Pentecost. Today is Wednesday, September 20th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word, where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thy Strong Word is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. You can learn more about their translating and publishing work on their website at lhfmissions.org. Well, please join me in welcoming my guest to help us look at chapters 3 and 4. It's the Reverend Thomas Eckstein. He's the pastor of Concordia Lutheran Church in Jamestown, North Dakota. Good morning, Pastor Eckstein, and welcome back to the program. Thank you. Good to be here. Excellent, excellent. Well, I've given you two chapters today. There's a lot of good stuff. It's going to be a lot of show today for us to get through, but again, it's a lot of it's a, a lot of it's narrative, but I think there's a lot of great things for us to discuss. Uh, I hope you do too. Um, before yes. we dig in though, um, maybe just start our time off in prayer. Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much um, for all the many blessings you give us. And as we study these chapters of Joshua, Lord, help us to see how just as you gave them victory uh, over your enemies, you, you ultimately give us victory over our enemies. And, and help us to see our greatest enemy was our own sin against you. And as we heard from the angels say to Joseph about your son in Mary's womb, that uh, to give him the name Jesus, uh, which is the uh, version of Joshua, uh, because he will save his people from their sins. And now that we are your forgiven people, rescued from the dominion of darkness, we know that ultimately on the final day, you will rescue us from those who hate you and your people and, and give us eternal life with you and your kingdom. Uh, bless us to this end, dear Heavenly Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, last time we met our heroes, verse 22 of the previous chapter says, They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned, and the pursuers searched along the way and found nothing. Then the two men, these are the spies, of course, they came back and they told Joshua, Truly, Yahweh has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. They're reporting back what Rahab had told them about how they, she and even the other people of the city had heard about the mighty works of their God, and if their God was with them, they were very afraid. Uh, anything else the people should know before we get to where, our, where the people of Israel are, and that is just on the wrong side of the Jordan. Yeah, well, just to comment about, um, you know, what Rahab says back already in, in chapter 2, she, she, she trusts in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She takes him seriously. She fears him, so to speak, because first of all, she said she heard about what he did in Egypt, and then she also heard about what he did to uh, Sihon and Og, uh, the kings that were destroyed while Israel was going through the wilderness and were opposed by them. And uh, this helps us to see uh, once again, that our Christian faith is not based on fairy tales, uh, 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 Aesop's fables and the like, but, but these are God's acts in history that people witnessed. Um, people in Egypt, both the Egyptians and Israel, witnessed God's uh, plagues and, and other miracles that he did, the pillar of fire, the pillar of uh, cloud, the, the parting of the Red Sea that Rahab mentions. And then she also uh, heard about God's actual dealing with Sihon and Og. And, and so what does this tell us? There were eyewitnesses of these miracles of God, and then others heard about these eyewitness reports. And, and so just as we have um, historical basis for Christianity, 
authority based on the eyewitnesses of the apostles and, and many others who saw Jesus after his resurrection and when he remained on earth for 40 days after. But here, even in the Old Testament, we see that there's eyewitnesses of God's acts in history. And I think of what it says, you're going to be reading this, but at the very end of chapter 4, let me just read the last couple of verses because it ties into this. Mm-hmm. Uh, Regarding the crossing of the Jordan, it says, For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did at the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. And then here's the key verse. So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So here we see that God has performed certain acts in history that, that were witnessed by many, precisely that the whole world might trust in him and receive his salvation. And I think we need to keep that in mind as we go through these two chapters today. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, even when God was active in Egypt during the plagues, we, when we talked about this, we learned that he did that to get glory over the gods of Egypt, but it's to make his name uh, glorious, yeah. to make his name known. And really, isn't that kind of the most simplest way to explain our vocation as Christians, to make the name of God known and his glory known? both through the things that we proclaim about him, but also in the ways that we behave. Because, you know, Rahab's trust in the spies didn't come because they proved themselves to her, but because she knew their God. And I guess there was this expectation that they're going to behave a certain way. Now, that's not always true, but it worked out for her. Yeah, and like Rahab, e- even though maybe we didn't witness God's acts in history ourselves with our own eyes, neither did Rahab, but but she heard of others that did. And so like today, we can talk about how, again, uh, Christian faith is not a... Uh, uh, a historical fairy tale. Um, there were people, the apostles, many hundreds of others who were eyewitnesses, and, and the New Testament even talks about this. And so I, maybe I or you or other Christians haven't seen this with our own eyes, but we can point people uh, to others in history who did, and that's exactly what Rahab does here. So we can be modern-day Rahabs in that regard. Well, as we move into our text today, chapters 3 and 4 is going to talk about Israel's entrance into the promised land, right? The the actual going in the promised land. Boy, they had been waiting on this. And anyone who uh, attempts to read the Bible from Genesis um, straight through, which by the way, is a rookie mistake. But anyway, um, <laughs> they're probably eagerly waiting for this moment too in Joshua 3. Let's, uh, let's just get into it. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, quote, As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet... There shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it, in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before, end quote. Then Joshua said to the people, quote, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow Yahweh will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, quote, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. All right, let's take a pause right there at the end of six. What stands out to me, brother, and and I'm sure you have some (laughs) really good insights about this, but just what stands out to me is this distance they have to maintain between the ark and, um, of course, themselves. 2,000 cubits. But but he tells them why. He tells them why. He says, because you've never been this way before. But I think there's also inherent in this a... A holy ground kind of stuff. This is a this is a yes. solemn observance of what's going on. Uh, t- take us right. through it, brother. Yeah, well, I uh, I even talked about this in Bible class this last Sunday uh, when we were um, uh, lo- looking at certain. We were talking about holy baptism, and we were uh, looking in in the book of Exodus where God comes down on the mountain and His glory is dwelling in the temple. So God does want to be close to His people, but but in the Old Testament there was always this distance 
that need to be maintained. In fact, when God was in the Holy of Holies, no one could go back there except for the high priest, and even he had to offer sacrifices for himself. So, so even though God comes down to be close to his people, there is this holy ground, this holy distance that needs to be maintained. And I think part of the reason is this is God's way of saying, you know, all, all these... Uh, 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 ceremonial laws that are pictures of Jesus, they're reminders that the sacrifice for sin has not yet been offered. And, you know, and I mentioned how, and it's interesting when Jesus spoke his final words on the cross, it is finished. You know, what do the Gospels tell us? That that curtain that was the, the divider, you know, uh, in front of the Holy of Holies saying, don't, don't enter, don't come back here. That was ripped in two by God from top to bottom as a way of saying, okay, now the ultimate sacrifice has been offered. We can now have much closer or access to God. But but at this time in salvation history in Joshua, that, that final sacrifice had not yet been offered. And so there's this sense of a distance needs to be maintained. God, God wants to be close to us, but, but at this point in history, there's still this, this buffer, this barrier that is maintained. Now, of course, we have direct access to God through Christ, but wouldn't you agree, though, that the concept of sacred space is not in terms of no one's allowed to come near, but all, but in terms of, you know, sort of a take off your sandals, this is holy ground. You know, I think oh, that's yeah. lost among us just a little bit. Uh, perhaps part of it is because of this closeness that Christ has been able to bring us to God. But at the same time, we shouldn't lose that awe and respect that comes from it either. So I think there's a lot of things going on here. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you, a good example of that is the Lord's Supper. We, we couldn't have a more close and intimate relationship with God than eating his body and drinking the blood of his son. And yet, we should not do this in a cavalier, casual manner. Uh, there's, that's definitely holy space, which is why throughout history, Christians, whenever we have the Lord's Supper, we, 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 we do so with great reverence and respect. Uh, because again, yes, you're right, we're on holy ground in, in that regard. Now, talk to us a little bit, just for those who may have just joined us today um, or uh, have forgotten. Tell us a little bit about the Ark of the Covenant, right? So we have the Levitical priest and the Ark, but what is that? What is the Ark? Yeah, well, well the Ark obviously is this, for, for lack of uh, 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 better words, uh, this box that was sitting in the Holy of Holies that, that, that God's people would carry with them as a symbol uh, of God's presence. And there were even things kept in the ark, uh, the manna uh, from the wilderness wanderings, um, Aaron's staff that had budded, uh, uh, and then especially the, the, the tablets of the, the, the Ten Commandments that were given by God through Moses. And, uh, but one of the most important things we have to remember about the ark which obviously is being carried here across the Jordan. Uh, but when it was in the Holy of Holies, especially on the Day of Atonement, uh, the, the, the blood of the sacrifices was poured over the ark. And uh, Paul even references that in Romans. He uses the Greek word. It's just one Greek word, the helosterion, but it's referring to the atonement cover where, where the sacrificial blood was poured. And, and he talks about how that was ultimately a picture of Jesus. So you, you can almost think of the Ark of the Covenant as, as a picture of, of the Word made flesh dwelling among us. And, and so uh, here, here we, we see that the Ark becomes a great uh, symbol uh, 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 pointing to, to God's presence among his people, uh, it, it ultimately in a gracious way. You know, uh, you, you mentioned the Ark of the Covenant today. A lot of people might think of the first Indiana Jones movie and how at the end yeah, of the movie, right. you know, all the enemies of God got zapped. <laughs> but, but when you look at the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament, most of the time it's meant to be a symbol of God's uh, saving presence. Uh, and here we see this in, in, in Joshua 3, where, where the Ark of the Covenant, even though there's, there's holy space, it's meant to give the people hope and comfort that, that the Lord is with them uh, for, for, to bless them and, and, and save them and care for them. Do you think there's any significance in the fact that priests are carrying the Ark? Because if we go back to Numbers, we see that it was Levites, but it wasn't the priestly part of the Levites that actually carried the Ark. Any significance in that, or what do you think? Well, we, don't, we can't say much more than what the Scriptures say, but I think uh, there's something to be said here that, uh, um, you know, e even though we're all 
you know, uh, uh, children of God through Christ, uh, there are different offices within the church itself. You know, in, in the Old Testament, you have the, the, the priests who have been given the duty of, of uh, you know, carrying out the, the holy things of God in the temple. Not just any person is allowed to do that. And, and we even have that uh, now in, in the Christian church. You know, we, we, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, equal in that sense, and yet we, we do have the pastoral office. Where, where God uh, works through the called and ordained servant of the Lord to deliver his gifts to his people. Um, and and uh, God works through that office in a special way. So I think I see that's what's going on here. You know, the priests have been set aside by God for, to, to carry out holy tasks that are ultimately for the benefit of God's people. Amen to that. I can get on board with that. Well, why don't we go ahead and keep on reading and see what happens next. Yahweh said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, so that they may know that, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, When you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of Yahweh your God. And Joshua said, Here is how you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore, take twelve men from the tribes of Israel, and from each tribe a man, And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Yahweh, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So, pausing there at the end of uh, 13. So, this isn't the first time we've heard something like this, is it? Oh, no, no. No, You know, and it's interesting how... um... Uh, you know, Rahab mentions, uh, you know, one of the things I heard about was the crossing of the Red Sea. Well, here, here we're having this miracle uh, taking place again. And, and one thing I want to mention before I forget to even uh, point it out, I, I love this line in verse 13, the Lord of all the earth. You know, one, one thing I explained to our people in a recent Bible study, you know, you have God's glory on Mount Sinai, for example. And I said, you know, in, in the pagan nations, uh, their gods were localized gods. Uh, uh, they lived at a certain place and only had limited influence. And, and uh, it would be erroneous, though, to think Yahweh is the same, as though Yahweh is just another one of these localized gods. No, he's not. Here we see, no, he's the only God. He's the Lord of all the earth. So the reason he comes down to Mount Sinai, or here is, is present with his glory, uh, uh, with the ark and in, in the Holy of Holies, is not because God needs a place to live. Uh, God's the Lord of all the earth. You know, uh, when, when, when we read this in light of Genesis, he's the creator of all things. Uh, but, but God has come down to be near us. We think of John 1.1, 1, 1, the word made flesh, who's the creator of all things, comes down to be near us. So I always like to point that out, too, that, that not only do we have this miracle here, uh, you know, that, that is similar to the crossing of the Red Sea, but this is being done not just by another one of these localized gods, but the Lord of all the earth, our creator. And an important thing to teach the people around them, too, as they're doing it, that, you know, you you may think that you have this God, but we have a God that's stronger. Of course, he's the only God, but you got to start somewhere. And then our God is the God of all the earth. It's, uh, yeah, it's a, a beautiful testimony. Now, we see them. Now, parts of the Jordan, they wouldn't have needed the water to be separated to cross. There were plenty of ways to cross the Jordan. It's not like the Red Sea necessarily. Uh, but in this case... There's lots of reasons for why they would prefer that. There's a lot of people who cross, but God uses this as an opportunity to connect it to the Red Sea in his power. Yes. Yep. Like you uh, correctly pointed out, even though the Jordan is by no means uh, you know, the same type of huge body of water that the Red Sea was, um, uh, God still, I think, uh, performs this miracle, not merely to make it a little easier for them to cross, but I think primarily just the, the miracle itself is a sign that he is Yahweh, he is the Lord of all the earth. And, and he even says that again at the end of chapter 4, the whole reason I'm doing this is so that people may know 
uh, I am God. And so, uh, again, I think the main point of this is that th- this is a gracious sign that God is giving the peoples. Oh, yes, and thanks to God for that sign. And, and Joshua says, here's how you shall know that the living God's among you, and that he's going to drive out. And then he lists, right, Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. So he, he lists off all of these nations that they will be wresting the holy land, or I'm sorry, the promised land from. Um, but of course, God is going to bring the victory. And it's important, I think, you know, they just got to the point where, well, actually, no, they haven't gotten to the point yet where they're going to be all recircumcised. But we're going to learn that there was some I guess, uh, lapsing in their faithfulness to God over this last generation. And so it's it's really like a fresh start for all of them. At least that's how I see it. Is that how you see it too? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, obviously, as, as you know, that, that generation that came out of Egypt, uh, because of their disobedience and unbelief, you know, they, they were cursed to wandering and said, oh, this is a whole new generation here. But I'm sure during those 40 years in the wilderness, uh, there, there, how, what, what, how, how to say it, a lapse in catechesis, maybe? <laughs> in yeah, that's a good one. And, yeah, and so th- there's a need here to, to begin anew, to lay an, uh, the foundation again. And um, one other thing I want to mention briefly, too, though, I, I, uh, before we go on, you know, you mentioned all the Hittites, the Hivites, all, all these other nations. And, and sometimes I've heard people say, well, wait a minute, I, I thought we've learned from Scripture God wants all to be saved. Well, he does. We have to remember that, that God gave these nations plenty of opportunities to repent. In fact, back in Genesis, when, when God was talking to Abraham in Genesis 15, he even says, I'm going to ultimately give you this land, but not yet, because the sins of these people have not reached its full measure, which is almost like God saying, I'm still giving them time to repent. <laughs> and uh, But even even now, when these uh, rebellious nations have, have rejected God and are going to be receiving his wrath, even now there is room for mercy because we think uh, of Rahab when she repents and acknowledges the God of Israel, even though she's not of uh, Israel, God has mercy on her. And I can't help but thinking that, that if, if these other nations would have fallen on their knees and repented, God would have had mercy. But, but, but we know many of them do not. And, and so this is God's way of saying, okay, I gave them plenty of time to repent. Yes, I ultimately wanted to save them, but they didn't want it. So now they're getting what they asked for. Such an important point, uh, it really is. And it's going to come up again and again as we read through Joshua, because that's a, a reasonable Com- not complaint, but a reasonable concern from people of the 21st century. It's like, well, you know, what did these people do to deserve this? And the truth is quite a bit. And of course, we've all, we right. all have done enough to deserve God's judgment. But reading 14 through the end of this particular chapter, which is going to be verse 17. Here we go. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people... And as soon as those bearing the ark had come as far as the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped into the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. It says in parentheses, the waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarathon. And those flowing down toward the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Thus endeth chapter 3. But uh, yeah, so what, of course, God promised to do, he does in this verse. Uh, But there's a couple things here that are probably worth pointing out, Um, not the least of which, and I'm sure you'll get to it, but is the heap, (laughs) the heap of water. That's that's, uh, an interesting visual. And as you know, it's interesting, I'm sure you, you're you aware of this very well, that, that uh, others have tried to, uh, whether it's the Red Sea or the crossing of the Jordan, describe this uh, in terms of natural phenomenon, you know. But, you know, I, I, can't, I remember uh, talking to my people about the Red Sea crossing when I did a sermon series on Exodus. It talks about how there were walls of water on both sides 
you know. And it's right. like, uh, okay, uh, how does this happen naturally? <laughs> and, and so you can't get away from the fact that there's a miraculous element going on here. Uh, you know, something so awesome that, that people realize, okay, we can't just explain this away, you know. And so uh, I find that this, the comment about the heap of water very interesting in that regard. Yeah, I mean, I've heard everything from, well, there was a sandbar. Now I'm talking about the Red Sea mostly, but there was a sandbar, or um, it's actually iced over, I've heard. <laughs> or, uh, you know, there's just all these try to naturalistic explanations. And of course, these are attacks on God and his word. Right. Doesn't mean that God can't use natural things and, and it still be right. both miraculous and from God, but. Yeah, it's hard to naturally explain walls of water, or in this case, the water just heaping up on itself. I, I, I if it was today, I'm sure everybody would pull out their cell phones and start taking pictures of it. Yes, um, exactly. In fact, I saw. Maybe that's great the whole point of a miracle, isn't it? That they don't <laughs> happen all the time. <laughs> well, yeah, so exactly. They get our attention. <laughs> I saw this great artwork series online, and I couldn't find it. If I tried, probably I'd have to Google it, but. Uh, it was, uh, I guess, AI images, but they were of the Israelites taking selfies as they <laughs> as they wandered through the – and it was beautifully done. It really was. It wasn't mocking at all. It was just, you know, you see kind of Moses with his arm out holding up his phone taking a picture, but uh, very neat, very neat. But in any case, um, the waters are coming down um, from above, stood, and rose up in a heap very far away. Well, we talked about the heap, but what does he mean when he's saying the water's coming down from above? Is he talking about like upriver? Certainly not it's not not rain or anything. Yeah, I know. I think I agree with you. I think he's talking about upriver. The, the, the natural flow of the water was just miraculously stopped. And, you know, um, and again, there's there's a lot of things we don't know exactly how this all looked and worked. But but again, I think there's a definite miraculous element that the natural flow of the river was was, you know, blocked at this point miraculously by God. Well, we have these cities of Adam and Zarathon. We don't really know where they are, but they're probably, you know, a couple, maybe 20 miles above Jericho or something like that. But but what's important, though, is he mentions these places and the people who would have been the original audience of this, they would have known exactly where these places were. And this speaks a little bit yeah. to what you were saying earlier, you know, the details, the historical details, yeah. even if some of them have been lost to time to us. They were there to show that this is not fairy tales. This isn't symbolic. It's not a parable. This is history, even if it's yes. amazing and miraculous. Yes. And I, I love the point that it made how, you know, this took place um, not far from Jericho. So imagine if Rahab heard about the crossing of the Red Sea all the way over in Egypt, what had happened. Mm. Uh, imagine this miracle now happening so close to Jericho. I'm sure the the the, the news was buzzing. And uh, again, God giving a sign, not just to his people, but all the peoples. Um, and I, I can't help but think ultimately that they might repent. You know, one yeah. quick comment on this. I know you're going to get to this later in Joshua, but when, when God commands them to march around the city seven times, you know, I've often wondered, you know, one time I thought, oh, why didn't he just go in and, and why wait seven days? You know, just go in there and get it done. Well, I've always thought, you know, maybe just maybe, and I have to be careful here because the text doesn't say this, but maybe just maybe the reason God did this for seven days was to give Jericho a chance to repent. I mean, just like uh, Rahab, God showed mercy on her. What, what, what if after a few days of marching, the people of Jericho finally said, well, we're, we're, we can't, uh, you know, rebel against the God. We need to repent like Rahab did. So who knows? But I, I can't help but think that, you know, the fact that God does this right in the near vicinity of Jericho is, is so that they will realize, hey, the God of all the earth is here. Uh, you need to repent and trust in him. Well, that certainly is within the nature of our merciful Lord, who does desire all people to be saved. But I tell you what, right now we have to take a break. So, hey, everybody at home, don't go anywhere. Pastor Eckstein and I will keep on going. and We're going to move into the next chapter, chapter four, when we see you on the other side.
These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend Thomas Eckstein. He's the pastor of Concordia Lutheran Church in Jamestown, North Dakota. Before we get back to our text and move into chapter four, I just want to thank you for taking the time to be with us in God's Word. Remember, if you have any questions or comments about the show, you can reach me at pastorboo at gmail.com, or you can find me on Facebook. Drop a note, say hi, but whatever you do, uh, reach out. I'd be I'd love to hear how you're listening to the program, whether it's over the air or podcast, online. Uh, but most of all, I just love hearing that you're out there and that you're getting something from the show, that God's blessing you through our study. Well, Pastor Eckstein, um, I'm about ready to move into chapter four, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, is there anything else you want the people to know from chapter three? Uh, not really. I said we have a lot to cover. Why don't we just dive into chapter four? Here we go. Chapter four, verse one. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, Yahweh said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of Yahweh your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of Yahweh when it passed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. Mm. So a uh, lot of catechesis being commanded from God, yeah. uh, something that we suspect might have lapsed a little bit in the wilderness. But as is normal, God wants them to set up a, uh, a memorial. And I, and I think that's interesting anyway, because, you know, we do that too. We do it through... Yeah. Uh, icons and images and statues and crosses and um, and even whole places are dedicated uh, to telling people about the works of God, like churches, but also uh, even you know temples and shrines. And there's all kinds of ways that we continue to do this today. Uh, but take us through this because I think that there's uh, you know, there's some a lot of significance here that people should know about. Yeah, well, just a couple of things. First of all, uh, obviously, uh, 12 men representing 12 tribes of Israel. You have the 12 stones. And, and, and here's the importance of, of, of Old Testament Israel with the 12 tribes, just re representing the entire people of God. And, and we see that this symbolism with 12 carried over in the New Testament, too, where you have 12 apostles. And then in, in the book of Revelation, where you 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 have uh, you know the the 144,000, which is uh, you know uh, uh, working with uh, various uh, uh, multiplications of the, the the number 12 as representing you know uh, God's Old Testament people as well as the New Testament Church. You know we're we're all together collectively uh, God's people, and and so it, this is God's way of reminding, hey, we're not leaving anybody out here. We're we're we're, we're all part of the family here. And, and we see this uh, in the New Testament where even the Gentiles get to be uh, grafted in and, and, and become part of this through faith in Christ. And then just one second thing, the importance of the memorial. Uh, obviously, future generations were not alive when this happened. Uh, future generations were not eyewitnesses of this event. But here we see it's very important 
that uh, God uh, stresses that they need to know about this event and remember it as as uh, the evidence that God did, definitely did act in history on behalf of His people. And and we do the same today. You mentioned whether it's having crosses or or or, or we think of stained glass windows that depict biblical events, or we think of just the way our sanctuary is structured with, with an altar and then the the cross above it. Um, These are all reminders of God's actual acts in history, real people, real places, uh, real events. In fact, I just started a sermon series on the book of Galatians in my church, and uh, one of the things I did is I included a map. Uh, of of the Holy Land area uh, around the Mediterranean, showing them exactly where Galatia was, primarily because I wanted them to know, you know, what Paul's talking about in Galatia, or in this case in Joshua here uh, uh, as well, is not a fairy tale, but it's about God's actual acts in history at specific places and specific times. And, And it's clear here in Joshua, God wants future generations to know about this. Yeah, I think sometimes we hear these names, these terms, these places so often from, you know, just the biblical point of view, and because they're not just down the road for us here in the United States, I, they do. They just become kind of uh, kind of like Charlie Brown's teacher, you know, wah, 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 wah. Right. But it, right. the truth is they are real places, and yeah, that's a great idea to make sure people know where they are. Um, let's keep on reading, see what happens next, uh, starting with verse 8. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, just as Yahweh told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. For the priests bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished, and that Yahweh commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. Uh, So actually, let's read a little bit more. So the people passed over in haste, and when all the people had finished passing over, the ark of Yahweh and the priests passed over before the people. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel as Moses had told them. About 40,000 ready for war passed over before Yahweh for battle to the plains of Jericho. And on that day, Yahweh exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. Okay, that's the end of 14. So they uh, do what they were commanded to do. That's certainly part of this, but... um, we ha- Joshua sets up twelve stones also in the midst of the Jordan. Now, unless I missed it, was he was he told to do that? You know, I don't know that he was specifically told to do that, but he obviously did. And and I, I also found it interesting. Not only does he uh, place them there uh, as reminders of what had happened uh, for future generations, but there's this little comment, and they are there to this day. So, you know, whenever the book of Joshua was written, uh, obviously there was this comment that, yeah, this happened in the past, and and uh, at least at the time this was being written, you know, they're still there. Now, obviously, uh, my guess is, and unless you know something I don't, uh, I don't think they're still there for us to see now, (laughs) but they they were obviously there at least for for a while for future generations to witness so that that they they could know that this uh, saving event took place. No, uh, yeah, I don't believe they're there anymore. But you know, as a kid, that always kind of confused me because you know I didn't really understand right. you know the audiences or when it was written and that kind of thing. But you know, you just read it and it says, "Oh, it's there today," and you're like, "Oh, that'd be neat to see." But of course, yeah, that was go there see thousands <laughs> and thousands of years ago. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, but they were there for a while, and at least until the time, as you noted, that the author of Joshua could say. Hey, listen, once again, you don't believe me? Go check out the stones. They're still there. That's that's where it yeah. happened. And, and wouldn't that, that be like to also make a pilgrimage? Yeah. yeah, no, that just reminds me of a similar thing Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. You know, oh, oh, hundreds of people saw Jesus alive. And you know what? Some of them are still alive. Go talk to them. <laughs> yeah, go, go ask them, right. Yeah, right. Well, so they do. They go quickly across, um, and the people passed over in haste, and when it was all done, the sons of Reuben, the sons of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed, and then 40,000 ready for war passed over 
before Yahweh for battle. I get the image of a general watching his troops go by, you right. know, in regiments. And uh, and this is literally what's happening. They're they're ready for taking the battle to the people of Jericho. Right. Now, here, here's a good example, too, of where uh, and, and, and people in our day can get confused by this, too. You know, um, we, we think of the hymn Onward Christian Soldiers. But, but we, we, we must remember that that in 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 at this point in history in Joshua, Israel is both church and state. You know, on the one hand, you, you, you have the priestly functions where, where God is delivering his gifts of salvation to his people through the, the, the priestly duties. But then you also have Israel functioning as a earthly government at this point uh, and God working through them uh, to carry out, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, discipline and even punishment on, on God's enemies in this world. And, and you think of Romans 13, where, where the Apostle Paul says that God works through earthly governments today to, to uphold good and punish evil. And uh, it's just that Old Testament Israel was both and, uh, whereas now today uh, the church is, is strictly spiritual, in 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 our duties, uh, God doesn't call us to go out and carry out functions of government and 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 take up physical arms to fight uh, those who are God's enemies. But but instead, our our the church's weapons are 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 God's word and and proclaiming the truth in love, and uh, and and so uh, it's important to understand that distinction between Old Testament and Israel. Because I've heard Christians. Some Christians look at this and go, well, you know, maybe the church should be doing something like this today. Well, no, uh, God has a different purpose for us right now. But back then, uh, God was working through Israel, as he would through an earthly government, to, 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 to bring justice uh, upon the evil of the earth. Yeah, so no mustering up the troops of the church, huh? I mean, I guess our warfare, so to speak, is all through the sword of the word, right? We're out there proclaiming yeah. law and gospel to the people and then God has given these kind of, um, well, I shouldn't say kind of these more literal sort of attacking. Well, that's that's for worldly governments, right hand, left hand realms. I think it's, uh, yeah, it is tough for people to understand today, especially those who are passionate and desirous of change in the world. Right. But you have right. to remember that God is going to be the one who is vindicating us. He's the one. And in these last days, the change that he wants to bring about is of course through changing hearts and changing his word, not by bringing people over uh, to the faith by the sword. That's never authentic. Exactly. And so Joshua is exalted high in the sight of all Israel, just like Moses. So we're going to see a lot as we go through. We heard it yesterday, and we're going to continue to hear it. The real connection here of Joshua, Yeshua being a a type of Christ or Yeshua yes. of the uh, of the New Testament um, of uh, of course our Savior. So uh, he's exalted Joshua in the sight of Israel. He's to replace Moses. Moses has passed on. Um, it's important that they unify themselves behind a leader. Joshua is not going to be perfect, but it seems like this event and God working these visible miracles through Joshua has really solidified the people's confidence that indeed Joshua is for lack of a better word, the new Moses. Yes, yes. And, and again, it's important that uh, whether it's Moses or Joshua or, or, or other leaders, you think of King David later on and, and other leaders in Israel, uh, as important as they were, they, they were ultimately uh, types and pictures of the true king, the true leader, uh, who is God himself. And, 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 and of course, uh, we know that, that uh, as wonderful as Moses and Joshua were, they had their faults, they had their failings, uh, they needed forgiveness uh, just like anyone. And so uh, we, we need to remember that as great as they were, uh, and as important as they were at this time in history, they, they were ultimately types and pictures uh, of our true King and Savior. So the whole people of Israel are all on the opposite side of the Jordan now. Well, except for the priests. Let's get them out of the Jordan by reading the next four verses, starting with 15. And you always said to Joshua, command the priests bearing the Ark of the Testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh came up from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up on dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all of its banks as before. Hmm. Now, a couple things. First of all, 
obviously God undoes this. That would have been an amazing sight again to see it just sort of all rush back. But he right. says here, overflowed its banks as before. So that might be a little bit of a hint on why they um, perhaps needed God to dry it up. Perhaps it was overflowed in the area where they were um, and they couldn't have crossed as easily. But but in any case, it's all returned to the to the way it was. Exactly. In fact, there was that comment in chapter three, that that parenthetical statement. Now, the Jordan overflows out its banks throughout the time of harvest, you know. And so uh, uh, there was, like you said, there was maybe very likely a need, uh, a practical need for God to do this for them. And so they've they've come out. uh, Things are going just as to plan. Now we're going to read 19 through the end of the chapter. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones, which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know. Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For Yahweh your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as Yahweh your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of Yahweh is mighty, and that you may fear Yahweh your God forever. So you brought this up at the beginning, where we're finally here, and that is the purpose of the twelve stones is, and the purpose of all of this is so that they may know and fear Yahweh their God. Uh, Tell us about this. Uh, Tell us also about fearing the Lord. It's a lesson that we can always relearn. I I, I think that, um, well, I just want to hear what you have to say. What do you think? Yeah, well, you know, uh, uh, when it talks about fearing the Lord, you know, uh, obviously in in a narrow sense, there is a place for literal fear in the sense that when we're sinners, you know, that realize we deserve uh, the just wrath of God, there's a place for legitimate fear, um, uh, uh, you know, to realize, hey, if I got what I deserved, I'd be toast. But but I I think in the Old Testament, the, the fear of the Lord is broader than that, even though it includes, you know, the fact that, oh, we deserve God's judgment. It also includes the fact that he's our creator and savior. In fact, when it mentions here that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord is mighty, I can't help but think of what God said to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12. He said, through your seed, all nations, all the peoples will be what? Judged, condemned, sent to hell? No. Through your seed, all nations will be blessed. So here we see that God's ultimate goal uh, is is to bring salvation to all the peoples. And so I think the fear of the Lord, uh, uh, maybe for lack of a better uh, uh, word, uh, is more uh, better understood as reverence, holy awe, that the God who, who would have every right to, to damn me forever um, is planning to save me ultimately through the seed of Abraham, uh, that, that I may be his own forever. And here we see, we know too that God had mercy on Rahab. And so that's, I think, God's ultimate goal for, for all the peoples of the earth. That's why he wants us uh, to know of him. And of course, the all the people's part's important in relation to Jericho and what we've already heard from Rahab, right? So that they may know the hand of Yahweh is mighty. So there's fear from, of course, the believers in God. And, and I think you're correct that fear is very multifaceted. But then for the other people, those who would reject God, then what are they getting? Not fear from awe and love because of salvation, but the mightiness of the one who is all powerful and well fights for his people. And so, yeah, this is if, if Rahab already said that the people of Jericho were worried about the Israelites because of their mighty God. Now, after hearing them, the miraculous event, which we'll definitely get to them that they crossed over. Oh my goodness. I, I, their hearts are melting as she said, probably even more. Um, also, we notice that this happens, all of this happens on the 10th day of the first month. Now, that's not the first time we've heard about that either, because back in Exodus chapter 12, it says, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. That, of course, is the Passover. So, I, again, I don't know if the if this is all intentional, but... 
in my simplistic understanding, I see the, the angel of death passing over the people. God establishes the Passover as a feast to be kept forever. These people now, they pass over the Jordan on the same day that they have to celebrate the Passover, which began back in Egypt. And of course, in the next chapter, they're going to. They're going to have the very first Passover yeah. in the Promised Land. Yes. And I, I can't help but think of the connection to it. It, it. Just like he says, well, you know, uh, w- when your kids look at these stones and ask, why are they there? You can tell them, well, you get the same thing going on with the Passover. Uh, uh, you know, later in Scripture, it'll say, well, when your children ask, why are we doing this at the Passover? You can tell them, well, it, it points back to these events. So, you know, um, uh, all, whether it's the, the, the stones that represent the crossing of the Jordan or the Passover itself, uh, these are all... Uh, reminding future generations of God's saving acts in history that, that apply to us here and now uh, uh, as God delivers his saving gifts to us uh, in our day, 2023, um, through baptism, through the preaching of the word, through, through the Lord's Supper, where we receive the very body and blood of Christ. And, and so uh, uh, God, uh, or I, I think of exactly what Paul says about the Lord's Supper. When we take the Lord's Supper, receiving Christ's body and blood in the present, we're reminded that he died for us in the past and that he will come again in the future. So, so the, uh, these, these, these signs are, are reminders of God's acts in history, past, present, and future. And so far as it's about uh, teaching kids or teaching future generations, we see once again where that responsibility falls primarily. It says, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, and I'll throw in mothers too, but it's parents' responsibility to raise their children up in the faith. And that continues even into the year 2023, the year of our Lord today. Um, Churches, pastors, catechists, we certainly serve uh, and obey the fourth commandment and we help parents in that duty but yeah. here just like in Deuteronomy 6 and other places we see it is the parents responsibility and so i just i hope that parents that are listening out there if you feel like you're ill equipped well then yeah. that's all the more reason to be in the word talk with your pastor yeah. but certainly don't abdicate that responsibility you know you don't hear yeah. the fathers of israel saying well we're not really teachers so we're going to let somebody else do that or we'll right. send them over exactly. to joshua why don't you teach all of our kids everything they need to know and then uh in a couple of years we'll we'll come and take pictures no it's your job it's your job yeah but that's one of in my fact, i want to get on a very brief i i totally agree with you i want to get on a very brief soapbox because uh, i always put on to my parents you know uh, what, what does luther say at each section of his catechism as the head of the family should teach his household and that's one reason uh, i have parents attend every confirmation class I, I i think one of the biggest mistakes we've made uh uh in, in the last decades of of our churches is is, is parents dropping off kids so the pastor can do it. Now, now don't get me wrong. You, you already said it's our privilege as pastors to, to preach the word and teach kids and, and to help assist parents. But that doesn't change the fact that the parents should be teaching the word at home um, uh, rather than just dropping all the kids off so someone else can do it. And I also think we need to change Sunday school in that regard. We have the same problem there. You know, I, I would like to see parents actually teaching their children during the Sunday school hour rather than, you know, dropping off their kids for someone else to do it so they can go have coffee. I mean, we, we need to change these things and get back to what Scripture taught. Yeah, the parents are the primary faith nurturers of their children. Yeah, we could certainly talk uh, a lot about that topic. It's one of my pet topics. In fact, it's uh, the core of my doctoral work was in equipping parents to be catechists of their children. So I love talking about that. But unfortunately— <laughs> We're toward the end of our program, so uh, we have a few minutes left, but I'm going to give you the last word, brother. One, One last thing for the folks at home. I guess what what I take out of this from Joshua 3 and 4, even though we see that God is going to be working through Israel to, to, uh, you know, to absolutely devastate Jericho, um, I, I, I always remind myself, God was patient with these people. He, 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 it's what we call God's um, alien work. He doesn't like to bring wrath upon the unrepentant. It's something he must do, not something he wants to do. God's true heart, though, is that he wants his name to be known among all the peoples. Why? So that they might fear him in the sense of having holy on reverence for his saving work on their behalf. And so even here in Joshua 3 and 4, with all this 
preparation for a military battle. At the heart of this, though, is a gracious God who ultimately wants to save people. Well, amen to that, and that's where we'll end. I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Thomas Eckstein. He's the pastor of Concordia Lutheran Church in Jamestown, North Dakota. Pastor, thanks again for being on the show. Yeah, my privilege. Tomorrow, join me and my guest as we explore Chapter 5. Encamped near Jericho, the Israelites undergo the rite of circumcision, something it seems they had failed to do for a generation, signifying their renewed covenant with God and their commitment to His commandments as they prepare to confront the formidable city. This chapter also describes that observance of Passover we talked about, that sacred feast celebrating God's deliverance from the Egyptians and their provision during the wilderness wanderings. Well, that's what we're going to talk about and a lot more tomorrow. So until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.